from Switzerland. It's Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and mom to four. Okay, I'm actually not in Switzerland. I am in my house. But by the time you see this, I will be in Switzerland. I hope I'm having a great time and not doing medicine. <laughs> Sorry, just being honest. Today, we're going to do a few myth first fact questions that you guys have submitted on Instagram. If you're not subscribed, please hit subscribe, turn on those bell notifications so you know when I post a new video. Let's answer your questions. Myth or fact, you shouldn't use a midwife. You can only have a certain number of C-sections. Amniotic fluid is baby pee? It's easier to heal from an episiotomy versus natural tearing? And doctors are weird about delayed cord clamping. We'll answer those myth versus fact after this. Okay, this one is from Trinity Wolf and it says, you shouldn't use a midwife. Myth or fact? I love midwives. Now, that being said, we need to talk a little bit about what is a midwife because in the United States, we don't really have a very good designation of who can call themselves a midwife. There are nurse midwives who have a graduate level degree in midwifery. They have gone on from an undergraduate degree and nursing degree to do further training in midwifery care, and they are wonderful. They are usually a very integrated part of the medical team. There are some states which still allow people who have not done any formal training outside of a post high school certificate to call themselves a midwife. And I don't think anybody should put the life of their baby and themselves in the care of somebody who has minimal training, has been to 20 deliveries, hasn't even seen enough deliveries, or helped with enough deliveries to know when something is terribly wrong. And then there are various certification levels of midwifery. So it's great to use a midwife. You should know what their training is and what their experience level is. I personally would never use a midwife who is not a certified nurse midwife who had a good relationship with a backup obstetrician in case they needed them for some kind of emergency during the process. But if I was a low risk patient and I had access to a nurse midwife, that would be an excellent option. And I think midwifery care is an option for helping the state of obstetric care in the United States. But the first step in that is we need to start at the top and we need to get regulated oversight of how someone must train in order to call themselves a midwife. I could never go to another state and just go, hey, I'm a nurse. It should be the same with midwifery, that you can't be a midwife in one state and that's illegal in the state next door. You need to have a congruent system of who is and isn't a midwife so that the general public is educated on that and understands who they are trusting to care for them and their baby. Next question. The A Team 05 says, a woman can only have a certain number of C-sections. I hear this a lot. People say like, oh, I've had three C-sections. I can't have another one. Or my doctor said you can only have three C-sections or something to that effect. I think this is, it's unusual when it comes up because we don't, or at least I've never worked with anybody who says like, you can only have this number of C-sections. The thing with C-sections is the more you have, the higher the chance of complications or injuries are from having. If you've had C-sections in the past, you develop scar tissue. The more surgeries you've had, the more scar tissue you have, the more risk there is for the surgery itself, injuring things like the bladder, the bowel, the ureter, which connects the kidney to the bladder. That can all happen with a little bit more frequency with each C-section. Other things that are more common with each increasing number of C-sections is abnormal placentation where the placenta grows too deep into the uterine scar and causes it to become too attached where it can't come out and you have to do a cesarean hysterectomy and that can be a life-threatening complication. So it's not a set number, it's just that each time you choose to get pregnant knowing that you will probably have a c-section again if that's what your medical history indicates or what you choose each of those surgeries comes with more and more risk each of those pregnancies comes with more and more risk so i don't 
I just don't think that that's like a cutoff of a certain number. So I guess I would say that's not a myth, but not a fact. Like it's not a certain number, but it also comes from a place of being important to think about with regards to risk. So for each person, I would say, talk to your doctor, talk to the person who did your last C-section and have a discussion about what is a safe number of C-sections for me. And obviously that's going to be, again, just a risk benefit analysis, but it's not just, I can give you a number. Number three, Nochi the Corgi says, amniotic fluid is baby pee. That is a fact. So amniotic fluid is not all baby pee, but it is made up largely, especially after you've gone through the middle of the second trimester of fetus urine. You have fluid before the baby has developed a urinary system, and then the baby swallows that, and once the baby swallows it, some of that comes out as urine and that is what amniotic fluid is made of. So yes, it is recycled fluid that the baby drinks and pees out. It's also made from other places in the placenta, but primarily, particularly in the middle and later parts of pregnancy, baby urine is what amniotic fluid is made out of. J.S. Peters 620 says, it is easier to heal from a natural tear than an episiotomy. Uh, so this is, this is also complicated because this depends on how it happens, but why don't we just talk a little bit about episiotomy versus natural tearing. It used to be thought that doing an episiotomy routinely, meaning just in everybody, would decrease the amount of tearing or make healing easier. And what we found over the last probably 10 years of improved research on the subject is that it's probably not a good idea to be doing routine episiotomies. Now, that doesn't mean there's never a situation where an episiotomy could be helpful. It, it should be a case by case basis. So in my practice, I always feel like there is time to talk about this. Even if I'm doing it for fetal indications, meaning baby's heart rate is low, we can still talk about it. So I can tell you, hey, the baby's heart rate is low. I think we should do an episiotomy because I think that will help us deliver the baby quickly. And if mom says, I don't want that, it's okay that my baby is in distress and I still don't want it, then I can't force somebody to do that. But I can explain to them what I'm seeing and why I think it would be important. And the other side of that is that I can also say, hey, I don't think you need an episiotomy because I do have people come to me and they say they want an episiotomy. They've read something that said that would make your tearing less or it would make it heal better. And that's not necessar necessarily true on an overall basis either. either. This is kind of another one of those that's probably in the middle. It's not myth or fact, it's case by case. It's what are we seeing clinically? What is the concern? What's going on? And then how well each one heals is largely dependent not on how it happened, but on how significant the tear or episiotomy was. So if somebody has a really bad tear, like a fourth degree laceration, that's not going to heal as easy as a second degree episiotomy and vice versa. If somebody needs an episiotomy because the baby is stuck and won't come out and the shoulder is lodged behind the pubic bone and there's not enough room to reach anything and they have an episiotomy that tears into a fourth degree tear or is cut as a fourth degree, which is the highest level tear that we have, uh, we grade them on a one to four. That's going to heal not as easily as a second degree laceration. So does that make sense? It kind of depends on the situation, the severity of the tear, far more so than it depends on how it happened. So I would say if you have equivalent tears, a second degree episiotomy versus a second degree laceration, they're probably going to heal almost exactly the same. So whether or not to do an episiotomy should be a case by case basis. 95 plus percent of patients that I deliver, I don't feel like need an episiotomy. And certainly I think that that's something we can easily discuss at the time if I feel like it's important or would be helpful. And it's always, always something we can quickly go over. Oh Baby Gifts and More says, doctors are weird about delayed cord clamping. I don't know. I mean, this doctor's weird about a lot of things, but I'm not weird about delayed cord clamping and I don't think anybody else is either. So probably five or six years ago, we got maybe longer than that. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Sometime in the past five to 10 years, delayed cord clamping has gotten more and more and more commonplace because we've had more and more and more supportive literature. It used to be that when we delivered a baby that was very preterm, we thought what we need to do is get this baby somewhere warm and wrapped up and with breathing help with the neonatologist. So we'd cut the cord, take them over as soon as possible. What we noticed is these babies require blood transfusion more often. So we started researching. 
can we delay the core clamping and decrease their chances of needing a blood transfusion? And can we do that safely? Meaning can we not compromise their temperature regulation in the process, their breathing help in the process? And the answer is yes. In a preterm baby, 100% is beneficial as long as the baby is crying and doing well or is able to be stimulated enough to do that, that you wait 30 to 60 seconds before you clamp and cut the cord. This increases the chances that the baby will avoid a blood transfusion. In full-term babies, we've seen some benefit in the research for that as well. So waiting 30 to 60 seconds after the baby's born before you clamp and cut the cord is something that's reasonable to do and probably a standard of care in most places at every delivery. As long as baby is happy and able to just go up to mom, we just wait 30 to 60 seconds to cut that cord. Now, importantly, it does slightly increase the risk of the baby having jaundice. That means it does slightly increase the baby's chances of needing to be on bilirubin lights, those like baby tanning bed things, if you do delayed cord clamping there's still benefit to it and most people want that and most places that you will see are going to be doing that standard. We do it in every delivery. If I didn't want to do it in every delivery, I would have to do it in every delivery because the nurses kind of want you to and they should because it's standard of care. So I don't know if doctors in general are weird about that. None of the doctors who work in my practice are weird about it. Everybody does it at the last hospital that I worked at. Everybody did it. So I think it's standard at least now, but it hasn't always been for sure. And that's because we've evolved with the literature. Once the scientific backing was there, we did better about doing the right thing because we had the right evidence. All right guys, I hope you learned something. Thank you for watching and liking this video and supporting my channel. My name is the same all over social media. Thank you from Switzerland. Not really in Switzerland right now, but by the time you guys watch this, I will be. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.